Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, sponsored by Fieldstone Communities, Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care and is now accepting residents. Um, they also offer day stay and respite programs. To find out more, schedule a tour of the beautifully appointed apartments on Rolling Bay, call 360-689-4314. Um, and in addition, I would also like to acknowledge that the Senior Community Center is on the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Suquamish tribe, the people of the clear salt water. We honor them and their legacy and are very grateful for their ongoing and deep hospitality. So welcome everybody, thanks for joining us. We're going to have some very interesting conversation today um, with Suzanne uh, Grandstrom, who has been interesting herself, learning a great deal about epigenetics. Suzanne, we have been seeing stuff about epigenetics popping up everywhere in the news lately, but it's not brand new, right? It's been around for quite well, a while. It's been around for a while, but I think it it's it's becoming more um, more of interest to many people because of the whole functional medicine movement, and I think that's played a role. And thank you very much for introducing me and and for having me. I'm really excited to get to talk to people about this topic. So, well, we're very excited to have you. And if you don't mind, I would love it if you could start off with a very, very, very basic explanation of what epigenetics are and how they affect our daily life. Because it's one of those things that if you start reading about it, you're like, I, yeah. but I have a feeling there's a very simple core in some ways. There is actually. And, and my, um, my interest is from a medical and especially nutrition standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I really like a very simple explanation as well. I thought that Reed's uh, description of what epigenetics was in the introduction was very thorough. Um, but for me, epigenetics really speaks to all the things in our environment, both internally and externally, that impact the way our, our genes express themselves. And, and from that perspective, I think it gives us a lot more agency over our health because we can understand that we have an impact in our behaviors. Um, there are things in our environment that we have less control over, like toxins, which definitely impact our genetic expression. But um, in a nutshell, that's what epigenetics is. It talks about all the various things in our environment and the things we put in our personal environment, our, ourselves, um, that impact either negatively or positively how our genes express themselves. That's short enough for you? I think so. If anybody you know, all through this, if you have questions, please um, either put them in the chat or raise your hand, or if I don't seem to see you, go go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask. Um, but I think one of the pieces that I've been most interested in myself is nutrition and, and dietary uh, changes or additions that a lot of people might wanna make when they understood what, how powerful the effects of certain things might be. Um, I'm personally a kale addict and like a leafy green person. And so are two, two or three people in my family. And I feel like it's almost a, a body urge, right? Your body mm -hmm. knows something is good for you and it makes you want them. Do you good feel like there's some truth in that? Oh, absolutely. Good for you. I think that that, yeah, that's a perfect lead into what I was hoping to discuss today. Absolutely. Um, or your body does know intuitively to a certain degree, but we um, sabotage that an awful lot by some of the foods that we crave that may not be good for our bodies. So um, definitely I'd like to talk about that. My, my field now as an RN has really shifted a bit and my primary interest is in functional nutrition and functional nutrition looks as does functional medicine. It looks at any kind of symptom and tries to go below that, try to, to find what the root cause really is. And so many of the things that we, um, ailments that we might suffer from really have a root cause. And lot, a lot of the time it can go back to what we're eating, uh, how much we're moving or not, how stressful our lives are and how we deal with that stress how much we're sleeping or not sleeping, all those things we're really learning play a huge role in our long-term health, so. So do you feel like, I mean, you sounds like you have put a lot of time into teaching yourself how to pay more attention to these effects 
and maybe even structuring your life in a little bit different way. Is that true? Can you tell us a little bit about, about some of the ways you might have changed your own life to oh, ab- work with these principles? Yeah, I've been interested in um, in nutrition and lifestyle most of my nursing career, which is extremely long. And um, but as I got older, I began to realize I needed to pay more attention to really how I was living my life. Um, and I worried about some of the possible genetic risks I was seeing in my parents and my siblings. And so I did take a 14 month intensive course and became certified in functional nutrition. So, and I made a lot of changes Um, and green leafy vegetables were always sort of a part of my life, but now they're a major part. So um, you're, you're on the right track for sure, Anne. Well, I have to say, I tend to put them in everything. And once in a while, I get a sort of a mournful plea from somebody in the family saying, could we have mac and cheese that wasn't mostly kale? <laughs> but I feel like, you know, there are ways you can, and maybe I overdo that, but but by kind of slipping nutritious things into all kinds of comfort foods that aren't particularly maybe nutritious at heart, I feel like we can kind of edge our beloved people a little closer and ourselves too, right? Oh, yeah, I agree with you. And I think that um, sometimes we can kind of inch out some of the, or crowd out some of the less healthy food if we're filling up with foods that are have lots of good fats, the good healthy fats, um, and foods that have lots of fiber. So absolutely, I put, I try to have something green in every meal. Um, and so I put a lot of greens in my smoothie every morning. Um, and I just, I think it it works, but I think we all have to figure out what will work. And I think for some people, it's kind of a slow shift. You know, they can't really make those changes right away, but little increments here and there make a big difference. And that's good news because I think a lot of us have a really hard time. It's sort of like the New Year's resolution. You're going to do some big change and you do it for about what, two weeks, three weeks, a month, and then pretty much you don't. But But thinking in smaller steps can be really a helpful way to go because most of us can do that pretty well if we keep on it. Yeah. Do you use actually like a schedule for yourself or how did you get yourself going with it? Changing? Um, no, I don't think I, not really a schedule. I mean, my life is pretty scheduled because of my work and exercise and those sorts of things. And I think that that's, kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it feels like that's sort of a human thing that we fall into a pattern that seems to work for us. And sometimes our work and those sorts of things interfere with that. But because I work for myself now, it's a little easier to schedule my life. But I did want to mention too, when we were, before we get away from the actual definition of epigenetics, I did discover when I was doing research to talk today that there are also, there's also something now, a study called Nutri nutrigenomics and nutrigenomics specifically studies how foods that we choose can change how our genes are expressed. So now from epigenetics, kind of looking at all the things that might affect our genes, now there's a scientific study and people headed in this direction of really looking at specific foods. So I, and then that to me is really fascinating. So yeah. Do you want to do you want to talk a little about some of those specific foods? Well, I haven't really delved into that much, but I can guess about some of those foods for sure. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, green leafy vegetables. It's one of the things that I wanted to be sure and mention today. Um, and, and a variety of vegetables. One of the things that I've learned that I find so fascinating is that different foods feed different bacteria in our microbiome in the gut. And so if you're not eating a variety of foods, you're not getting a really diverse bacteria in your gut microbiome and the microbiome of our gut and, the, and our whole body microbiomes do so much work to protect us. So a variety of greens is really important. Kale is wonderful, but you should be adding in, if you feel like it, a lot of different greens and try dandelion greens or try, um, um, collard greens and and just get some variety in the mix of greens so yeah actually there's some wonderful braising mixtures that have all sorts of leafy greens in them and I love to use those myself yeah. um, but I think for a lot of people it, it you know thinking past I've heard, I read studies that say that most of us tend to eat like five vegetables mm-hmm. 
<laughs> that you pick something early in life and you stick with it. And many people don't get much past that. And so thinking about ways to encourage ourselves to get a little past our, what would you say, our reflexive diet mm -hmm. um, and start branching out a little bit might be, especially with the holidays coming when comfort foods are looming on our right. <laughs> yeah. horizons, right? Right. Well, that's one of the things I hope to do today is to challenge the people in, who are watching to do a little exploring and perhaps spend, you know, spend the month of December adding different greens and having a salad every day um, and putting more vegetables. I know people who eat like two vegetables a day. That's it. Uh, or in their lives. Um, broccoli is a big one for lots of people. And broccoli is really good for you, but there's lots of other crucifer vegetables that you could add. Um, and so I would, you know, I would love to challenge people in the group to begin to add more vegetables, explore a little bit, see what else you could throw in a salad. I try to make a salad with at least five to seven things in the salad. Um, and and that, that helps, that makes a big difference. So the other thing I want to encourage people to do if, if it's a challenge for December to do, make some kind of positive change in health would be to add an apple a day. And we've all heard that all our lives, <laughs> but I've been reading more about apples lately and they're really, really healthy for us. Um, they have five grams of fiber in a, in a single apple. That's a lot of fiber and your body needs that fiber. Um, and there's all kinds of other uh, vitamins and minerals that help fight inflammation. And it's kind of, and that's an easy thing to do, to have an apple. I usually cut one up and I have it in the car with me. So I'm going between things. I can have a snack in the car, which isn't the best way to eat things, but and from a digestive standpoint, but at least I get at least one apple in a day. So, and that's pretty easy change to make, to add an apple, so. And think you'd be like honoring your mom. Didn't everybody's mom say to eat an apple a day? My mom and my grandmother would both be thrilled. That's right. And you could stew them. You could um, bake them without sugar in it, but with just cinnamon on them. There's a lot of ways that you could prepare apples to get in one a day. Um, but it, that feels to me like a really simple way to shift things. And the idea is the more minerals, the more fiber, the more vitamins, uh, the more antioxidants you're eating, the better your body is able to defend itself against invaders, your immune system will function better. Um, and, and, and for reasons that I don't fully understand either, it does slow down the expression of certain um, genetic risks. And that's, and when I started this, that was my main goal. I have two siblings who have dementia, one younger and one older. And I began to think about why, why is my brain still working? And what do I need to do to make sure it does? And I've learned so much and food is definitely can be the very best medicine. So that's been my approach. So food as medicine has been an idea that's been around for thousands of years in some cultures, but not necessarily ours as much. And so can you talk a little more about that sort of that whole movement or, you know, how that applies to us daily? Yeah, I, I think I think part of the movement, the reason it applies to us daily is that the traditional medicine system in the United States has become overwhelmed and I think has let us down in terms of chronic illness. They function really wonderfully. We definitely need to have the medical system we have for acute kinds of problems and to take care of things when they get out of control. But prevention hasn't been in the forefront. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but I think over time, more and more people have begin, begun to realize that they wanted to take agency of their own health. Mm -hmm. and be more involved, number one. And number two, more and more people providing care began to realize there had to be a better answer than just constantly patching people up or watching people have these chronic illnesses that we really couldn't offer very much to them in terms of relief. So I think there's a whole, and it's not brand new, this has been going on for a while, but there's definitely a, a lot of people headed in the direction of looking at more of the root causes and trying to find ways for people to change their internal and external environment so that they feel better. And they may not be cured, 
but they feel better, they're doing better, their symptoms are disappearing. So part of it may be to pay more attention to how we feel when we eat certain kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I know, especially in the holiday season and in stressful situations, which let's be clear, we've been living in a extremely stressful situation locally and nationally for years. Um, we may be pulled more, and whether it's culturally, biologically, emotionally, pulled more toward foods that maybe, you know, that are immediately satisfying, but not really healthy. Um, and paying attention to how we feel, not in the moment, but 10 minutes, half an hour, an hour later might help us be more aware of the way those foods are affecting us. Oh, I think absolutely. And there are some people who are really affected in a very negative way by some of those foods, no question. Um, one of the biggest culprits, I think, and, I, and I'm not, I've learned this, I'm not standing alone in this belief, is that refined sugar has really created havoc for our health. It has no nutritional value at all. Um, and it, and in fact, it has no fiber. It's all been removed from the sugar cane. It has no vitamins, no minerals, but we do need to use vitamins and minerals in the metabol metabolizing of um, cane sugar. It increases things like depression. I think it plays a role in dementia. Some people call dementia diabetes type three and that perhaps diet and insulin resistance may play a role. I, I think there are people who would argue with that, but it is a thought process that you have to kind of consider if you're thinking about diet. So white sugar feeds cancer cells. There's a lot of reasons. Um, and as I said, it really contributes to depression for people and mood problems. So there's a whole lot of reasons to get rid of white sugar. And unfortunately, uh, culturally, it's a huge part of Thanksgiving celebrations and now it's Christmas cookie time, all those things. So that's that's a really tough one to move away from, but um, it's so important. It's really, it's really important to let go of white sugar and it's difficult for people. And well, I understand why. Yeah, I read that part of why we crave sweetness is because in so many natural diets, it was very rare. I mean, for 10,000 years ago or whatever, so that our bodies were sort of honed in on it like in I think about the Native American people of the of the coast here who um used to eat salal berries and find them yummy and I gotta say you know that's yummy for someone who never ate a Twinkie that's but, right. right it's like so people whose taste buds were not already corrupted kind of could appreciate natural sweetness in much smaller doses right but right. it feels like you know when you look at I mean, I read salad dressing and there's sugar in salad dressing. There's sugar in everything, really, practically. You have to be very careful to find something that does not have some form of sugar in it. And that means you have to know what all those forms are named, right? That's um, right. You have You're to be right. really vigilant. That's right. I think you have to be good at reading labels, number one. But the other thing I would suggest is because sugar is in everything, our craving has been fed and mm -hmm. fed and fed. And that's why it's hard for people to switch. Um, and a lot of people need to just kind of detox from sugar. There are other kinds of ways to get sweetness that still might elevate your blood sugar a little bit, but you get, at least you're getting some value. And that to me would be maple syrup, raw honey that still has all the vitamins and minerals that, the, that came with it, the bees gave it. Um, those things still used in moderation. And when I work with my clients, the first, oftentimes the first thing we do is start getting away from white sugar. And I try to educate them about all the risks um, from white sugar and then move on to finding some substitutes that will tame down their sweet tooth um, and, and then move on. And there's so many ways that you can still bake without using white sugar. So, and, th and that's just a start. If somebody has diabetes, then it's a different story. It's gonna be the maple syrup may not be good for them either, or the raw honey, you need to choose other things, but there's lots of substitutes for refined white sugar. It's just a matter of learning about them. And then, as you said, you have to be vigilant. Well, I do know people who use grated apple or mint chopped mm -hmm. banana mm -hmm. instead and sort of teach themselves you know, and those are natural sweetness. They're really quite sweet if you haven't just eaten a Twinkie, right? That's right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but I'm curious a little bit about, is would you say that 
is there a, a beneficial diet for depression and anxiety? Absolutely. And it's going to be just what we've been talking about. Lots of vegetables, a variety of vegetables, getting off of white sugar, lots of whole grains, foods with fiber. Um, there's actually, there's a doctor named Dr. I forget her first name, Umdo, I think, U-M-D-O-O. -O. She's a psychiatrist who works with people with um, dementia, dementia, depression, and other diseases. Um, and she, she's a firm believer in nutrition as the best medicine for those patients. And so there are plenty of foods, but what I would say in terms of specific foods, I think if you can get yourself on a really healthy, high fiber loaded with vegetables, also loaded with good, good healthy fats, not, not the trans fats, but there are some fats that we do need like avocado, provides a really healthy fat for your brain and the rest of you. Um, but to me, that's the very first step. And then begin to look at, I still am feeling depressed, for example, if that were the, my client, and then to fine tune it and see what else we could add to the diet that would help. What do you, uh, it sounds to me like you're saying that rather than using supplements like flaxseed oil, it might be better to actually use flaxseed. Flax seeds. Yeah. I, well, I think flaxseed oil has its place. Um, you get more of the benefits from what I've read, more of the benefits in the oil, but number one, it gets rancid pretty quickly. So it's tough to maintain and you don't get the fiber. So absolutely, I recommend always to my, I use flaxseeds myself and I really recommend to my clients and my family members and anybody else who will listen. It's just a really good way to get omega-3s and also get some fiber. So just start slow. Don't don't have don't start with a half a cup. So teaspoon. So would you say for breakfast if you had oatmeal with grated apple and a tablespoon of flaxseed? Excellent breakfast. I don't, you could throw on some uh, blueberries too. They're really high in antioxidants, and raspberries are good, but blueberries are the famous one. So, yeah. If you're gonna go with dairy, would you say like yogurt, kefir? I mean, what? or mm -hmm. what kinds of things do you find most effective or helpful? Um, well, I, I recommend yogurt that is um, somebody like Nancy's yogurt. I don't have any stock in Nancy's. It's just, I know it has a whole lot of uh, live bacteria in it. So you want a yogurt that has good bacteria in it. Uh, coconut yogurt for people who don't. Yeah you brought up something wonderful, fermented foods of all kinds are really starting to be seen in the market again. And it's because they're so good for us. Um, and so that's another thing my grandmother would be happy to see is that we have sauerkraut in the, in the refrigerator now. But sauerkraut and kimchi and kefir and all those things are feeding your uh, gut with healthy bacteria. Um, and so instead of rushing out and getting probiotics, which sometimes we definitely might need, it makes good sense to start with um, something like kimchi or, or sauerkraut that's going to nourish your gut bacteria. I was at Town & Country um, when they were having a sale on the, a particular kind of kimchi, and it was, it was really something. It was a young man with three little boys, and he had the cart full of kimchi. And all I could think of is he's getting them off to a really healthy start. And I kind of chuckled at him. I said, you're buying a lot of that. And um, he said, well, yeah, the kids really like it. We have a little bit every day. So he really had a handle on it. It was great, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. What would you say about sourdough that's fermented? Uh, yeah, I understand that. I, I, don't, um, I don't eat bread, except bread that I make that's gluten-free. Um, so I can't speak to it too much, but I think if you can tolerate gluten, which a lot of people can't, but if you can tolerate gluten, I think it's a good choice for sure. And it's certainly delicious. And I know that during the pandemic, it was what people all over the world were, were learning to do. So, Yeah, and in the, the Waldorf tradition, at least, um, fermenting the flour, like letting flour steep in water, um, even overnight, is, is considered a way to make bread much less harmful and much more um, 
available to your body in, in beneficial ways. Do you, would you say that's part of that fermentation thing or? I think probably, yeah. It's not something I know a lot about. I haven't really delved into that, but I think that makes sense for sure. And the more fermented any kinds of more bacteria that you can introduce to your diet that way makes sense. Definitely. So well, we've talked about vegetables and how a lot of people only use a few what would you say, do you have like a top five or a top 10 that you think are among the most beneficial? Um, greens, 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 <laughs> um, and the Christopher vegetables. I try to put cabbage in my salad every day. So that's very helpful. Top five. No, I, could, I don't think I could do that because carrots and beets, the only problem with greens and cabbage is it doesn't include lots of colorful foods and you do right. want to include color. So I could do the top 10 maybe. Carrots and beets and red cabbage and green cabbage and kale. Uh, I grow arugula in little pots on my deck. Uh, it's still growing actually. And I just go out with the scissors and cut that. Sometimes that's what I throw in my smoothie. So arugula, very good for us because it has a bit of a bitter taste. Okay. And the bitter is really good for our systems, our digestive system. Um, I guess, yeah, that would be my top. I don't eat tomatoes. A lot of people can't tolerate tomatoes, which is too bad, and I'm one of them. Um, but there but there are plenty of, oh, squash, all the squashes, pumpkin, acorn squash this time of year. The more color, the more greens, the more fiber, the better. I think that's uh, one of the things, when you were saying broccoli is one of the two vegetables a lot of people eat. The other is probably corn. Um, yeah which, you know, many children start loving corn because it has such a high natural sweetness. Mm -hmm. But would, is that one of the better ones or one of the ones to be a bit more circumspect? No, I, think, I think corn is just fine. Yeah, it's just not, it's not something that I eat very often, but, um, and I can't explain why there's, but it, yeah, I think any vegetables, if you like them or you can learn to like them, eat them. Um, and tomatoes are really healthy. It's just, there are some of us who really can't tolerate them. Um, but no, I think corn is fine and you're right. I was having, um, I always have a bag of frozen peas in my freezer because they're great to toss into something and you don't get them year round. Um, but I was thinking about th that, what you just said about the corn recently. I mean, that's a typical vegetable that kids also eat is carrots and corn to, I mean, carrots and, um, and peas together. So, and both of them are really good too. If you, any vegetables that you can like, you can get kids to like, then make sure you're getting them at every meal. That's the important thing. What would you say about seeds and nuts? I mean, they're high in protein. Are they, and I've heard some of them are quite beneficial for your brain function, especially as we get older. Yeah, they are, they're very good for you. And I think one of the things that I, I don't know this, but I think one of the one of the really difficult things for a lot of people health-wise of my generation now and a couple before me or one before me was the whole fat-free craze where we were told that fat wasn't good for us and you should be eating skim milk and drink, drinking and, and not eating any fats. And in place of fat, sugar was put in, which is part of why we got more and more as a culture addicted to sugar. And myself too, I used to love sweet things. I still do. Um, but I think fats, fats uh, are important for your brain health, especially your brain needs fats. The rest of you does too. So um, I think nuts and seeds are great. I eat them every day, a variety again. Um, and then flaxseed oil a little bit, but flax seeds are good for that too. And all the other things that might give you omega-3s. I'm sort of drawing a blank right now, but there are other things. Yeah. Well, what about fish versus fish oil? Oh, well, there's a lot of talk now about all the mercury um, in, in fish. Um, so so um, I do take a vitamin a supplement for fish oil because I don't... I, I haven't eaten meat in such a long time. That's probably since the eighties that it's hard for me to get fish down. I just can't quite tolerate the texture, I think. But the fishes that I think are good for people right now that in, in terms of toxins would be the smaller fish, you know, like sardines and um, herring. Um, and, and it's certainly not something I'm authority about fish, 
but I do think that flaxseed oil with its omega-3s is cleaner. You know, you can get that organic. You can't really make a fish that's organic. And there's so much toxin floating around in our oceans now that I worry about that. Yeah, that's really a sad thing. When I was reading that sea salt has so much plastic particulate matter in it oh. that we should be eating mined salt instead, <laughs> I just was crushed. You think, ah, you know, there, and yeah. that's one of the issues that, you know, organic food is definitely, in, well, in my opinion, in my research, organic food is more nutritious because the soil is healthier mm -hmm. and um, the plants definitely store and use those soil nutrients better so that the, the end result for us, the, the produce is higher in nutritive value. Um, but yeah, unless we're act actively nurturing the soil, you know, it, it may not really be, I mean, it isn't what it was. It, soil scientists will tell you agricultural oh. soils today are far degraded from what they were 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Um, so we have to really think about organic food, I think. Do you think that's extreme or what would you say to that? Oh, no, I, I agree completely. Um, there's a great program on Netflix. I think it's called Kiss the Ground. Mm. Um, it all talks about regenerative farming um, and how from way back decades ago, we destroyed the earth and the soil. And so now people are working to, in certain areas, to get the animals back on the soil, to poop there and to really take care of it. So I agree with you completely. I do think, um, and so I try to buy organic. There are certain, the price is higher and I think that's tough for some people. So have you heard of the Environmental Working Group? Mm -hmm. And yes. so, yes, they have a wonderful list that they update every year called the Dirty Dozen. And I think it's then the Clean 15. And the Dirty Dozen are the foods that you really should, if you can, if you're able to find and buy organic. And then the, dirt, the Clean 15 are a little safer. They're, they're less likely to have high rates of pesticide. And that's one thing I'm glad you um, steered me in this direction because one of the things I wanted to mention about apples is they are on this year, they're on the dirty dozen list. Mm -hmm. So if you can buy them organically, do because that's that's going to be a little healthier for you from the toxin standpoint. That's why it's wonderful to grow what you can. Um, yes. Yeah. And I'm my aim now, it's harder for me to get down into the garden to work as much. So I'm I'm really trying to grow more things on the deck in big pots and I've had pretty good success. Um, and then I know exactly what ha what the soil is happening with the soil um, and and that it's not being sprayed and it, it doesn't have any pesticides. So. Exactly. And yeah. Rita and I are doing the gardening at the senior center and we've got mm -hmm. things in troughs. And one of the things we have in two troughs is strawberries. And they're often high on the dirty dozen list. They are. Because commercially grown strawberries, if they're not organic, often are very heavy in pesticides. And because they're so permeable, the pesticides penetrate quite far into it. You can't peel a strawberry and have anything right. else, right? That's right. Um, so I would just like to say to anyone who's here, we have about, I don't know, what would you say, Rita, 500, 1,000 um, little offsets that if anybody oh, wow. would like some, we have the Marshall strawberries, which were the original berries grown on the island when it was the berry basket of the sound. And we have, what are the other ones, Seaside? You're muted. <laughs> That's unusual for me to be muted. Um, I think they're called seascape. Seascape, you're right, thank you. And I think um, they're ever bearing. Well, they're so ever bearing that they actually have fruit on them right now. Mm -hmm. They were confused by the heat in the summer. Plants don't know the difference sometimes between heat and cold. And so when they get shut down um, by weather, when they wake up, they tend to think depending on the temperature that it, you know, like now they think it's spring. So they were blooming and actually setting fruit. Uh, even though they were off by six months. But um, yeah, they are ever bearing. But that, that would be if somebody here in the audience would like to try their hand at strawberries, they do very well in raised beds and we can guarantee they're organic. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I have them growing in two great big containers on my deck. This is the second or third year and they throw off little shoots. The only challenge I have is the squirrels. And I live in Rolling Bay, kind of in the forest. Oh. And um, so that it, we have to get, pick them as soon as we can, because as soon as they get, the squirrels are very picky also. As soon as they get ripe though, they end up having little nibble marks all over them. So and they yeah. never finish one. They don't no. like eat one and be done. They taste each one. 
That's right. Exactly. Yeah. It's super annoying. Yeah. It so is. we'd started talking a little about a diet for depression and anxiety. Um, but how effective do you feel like that is as a tool for those of us who might be prone to those things? Well, I think one of the things about anxiety and depression that I've learned um, is that that's really a symptom. There can be a lot of things that can cause depression and anxiety. And so having someone who can dive a little deeper with you, like a functional medicine physician or a naturopath, just to look and see while you're, I mean, if the depression is severe, I think you need to be treating it in some way. I'm not a strong fan of uh, antidepressants. There are just so many people on them, but some people truly need them. But I think at the same time to begin to look at what's really going on, what's the under underneath problem. Um, it could be as, as much as some kind of a gut problem, bacteria that's you need to really clean up your diet. It could be just sugar, could be all a, a diet too heavy in cane sugar or heavy at all in cane sugar. So the, I think the key with that is that you need to have someone who will look a little deeper with you while you're treating the acute phase of it. And I can use myself as an example. During the pandemic, I had such anxiety at times um, and I, it ended up causing some cardiac problems for me. I had a lot of irregular heartbeat and then I sort of have a panic attack because my heart was beating so fast. And I worked with my cardiologist and not with medication, but just, he reassured me, things were fine in there. I just needed to do some things like meditation, get back into my yoga, which I did, and begin to change how I eat. And, and um, I don't really have a problem with anxiety anymore. I might get anxious, but I know how to deal with it now. And I think those are the things you need to have a team of people who can help you go a little deeper and figure out for you as an individual, what will help here. You've said, um, you've used that term functional medicine practitioner a couple of times, and that's a fairly new one, I think. Are there, are in, do you know of functional um, medicine practitioners locally or regionally? Well, um, I think functional medicine is probably a slightly newer term. To me, it's very similar to people who call themselves integrative physicians or holistic back in the 80s, 70s and 80s. But the thought process behind that is that it's a doctor who is going to delve a little deeper and look for a primary cause, not treat the symptom with the medication at first, unless, like I said, with depression, some people, their depression is so severe, they do need to have some help. And that should happen at the moment. And then while you're while that's being treated, begin to look at the underlying cause. There are lots of natural paths here um, on the island, I know. And um, as far as functional medicine doctors, I'm not sure about that. I've done a little research and haven't really found anybody who identifies themselves in that way here. Over in Seattle, definitely. But um, they're probably here. I just probably haven't had time to search them out yet. <laughs> So maybe they'll come forward. Well, you also mentioned yoga and um, made me think about, you know, both activity and meditation. But in terms of activities, yoga would certainly probably be one. Would you say like that has an epigenetic effect on our being? Oh, I, I do think so. Both yoga. I think all movement does because we're getting it has an effect on our health and probably our, our genetic expression for sure um, but it has an effect because we're breathing deeper we're moving so a, a walk every day would would be beneficial um, and a walk is great for your mental health too there's no getting and it's good for your heart all those things um, but yoga it, yoga also involves a lot of breathing it involves balance and focus and so people, an older woman like myself definitely needs to think about those issues too balance and, and so yoga has been really fabulous for me. And I used to practice pretty regularly and then fell off of it, but I did find it helped me a lot during the, um, the pandemic. Um, and the deep breathing aspect helps you focus and calm yourself down um, and meditation as well. And then of course, depression and anxiety, a, a professional therapist to help you sort through what's going on there is also really valuable. But sure. Yeah. 
I just think about different kinds of exercise as we get older, it becomes a little more challenging sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I have vertigo, for instance, and there are times when walking is really an adventure, but it's not a good one. Um, <laughs> so I have a walking stick, you know, and try to remember to use that. But, but, you know, as our bodies change, obviously, you know, we yeah. start thinking more about, oh, so what's going to affect, what can I do proactively that will help me have the best health that I can, right? And this whole epigenetic approach seems really interesting to me, but I'm thinking about how will I, I guess, prove to myself that the changes I'm making are having an effect. Well, I don't think you can do a double blind study on yourself. <laughs> so I'm not sure that you could, I think, I think how you feel should be proof enough and, and how, um, how much energy you have and how well you might sleep if that's been an issue. Um, so, and, and I don't, but I think it's just going to have to be an individual thing. Most people will find, I, I believe most people will find they are feeling better. If there's been some resistance to losing weight, difficulty dropping pounds. I have one client, we're not working on weight management, but she's off of refined sugar and we're doing some other work. Um, she has some depression and some other health things going on, but she's been dropping weight as well. And, and that for her was a side effect she didn't expect, but that also will help with, um, with all the other health issues going on. So I think, it, yeah, it'd be tough for you to have any guarantee, I guess is what I'm saying. But I'd be really surprised if you didn't feel better. Um, and while we're talking about the, the exercise and movement, everybody's really unique, but there, there are so many of us now who are in their, our 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, who, and so there's many more options in terms of gentler exercise that we can partake of. Um, I, I'll do a plug for the yoga house. I go to Paul's class and Paul is my age and it's a wonderful class. He, I, what do they call it now? Sustainable yoga, it used to be called, but it's a class full of people who are either healing from some sort of illness or surgery, or people who are my age and just need to take it a little slower. Um, and those those options are around. And I'd also say swimming could be a wonderful exercise for some people because it's non-weight bearing, but you're still moving your muscles. And so there are lots of options. Oh yeah, at the senior center, we have some chair classes, chair oh, exercises. Oh, you do, that's classes. right, well, yeah, then, absolutely. Which are really helpful. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine is proposing now that um, a dance chair class, she is a, 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 a trained dancer who's done dance Ooh, therapy wonderful. with seniors. And she's she's proposing a class where you would be in a chair, but you would do these wonderful dance moves um, so that if you have like balance issues, it wouldn't mm -hmm. be a problem. And I'm so excited about that idea um, because I think that sounds like a way to kind of ease yourself into movement that might feel dangerous or unsteady if you were on your feet, but will feel really comfortable in a chair. Oh, absolutely. And I think um, somebody wanted, had their hand up. Yeah, Rita. I was gonna to say too, at the senior center, we've got gentle stretching two days a week and then gentle, there, there's like four gentle classes. Which is great, yeah. Which is great. And it's they are great classes. You can take take your time and then balance classes and stuff there there's a there's a lot offered that is that is really good because I can still walk but I get a little you know take the dog out and for me walking is really good and um and the other thing with sugar is that it just swells you up so bad <laughs> and I just finished my last piece of Rocky Road and I'm done <laughs> done Good. I'm glad to hear it, Rita. <laughs> but, but, but it makes such but it makes such a difference. And I know that about myself. So we're done with that now. Forever. <laughs> I do want to add, add something about the chair yoga that um Ann you brought up. I, I, I had a back injury a while back, and so I started going to chair yoga classes. Um, and got me strong, helped me get strong enough that then I could start doing yoga standing again. So it's a great interim for some people also. Uh, it's a great option, chair yoga and chair dancing sounds wonderful. Using all that upper body movement, that would be great. Right. And we do have sale classes, which are run by Cassette Physical Therapy. Um, and we've got, they're just so popular. I think they're every day now, aren't they? Um, they were three times a week and I'm pretty sure they're 
ever gone to four or five because so many people were wanting to be there and it, oh, you could only have X number at a time. So, you know, yeah, at the senior center, we're very, very much interested in making sure we have some form of exercise program for whatever level you're at. Um, and yeah, and sometimes for us, it might be seasonal, right? Like for me with the vertigo, it's mostly in the fall, but in the spring I could do regular yoga and I do, right? So we can think about, okay, post-surgery, maybe we have one way to kind of heal ourselves. But I'm sort of rolling it back to the epigenetic thing and thinking, as we remember that epigenetics is the way that everything in our environment affects our genetic expression, is that right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about, and somebody brought this up earlier, is there anything, I know it's been kind of a, um, maybe not sketchy, but not always mainstream to think that there could be inherited factors. Oh, absolutely. I think there are inherited factors. Um, I'll, I'll use my own history as an example. Um, one of my siblings does have APOB, I think it is, which is a gene that he's inherited that makes you more at risk for Alzheimer's. Um, but you can have dementia without having that gene. Um, and so, so th there's no question there are inherited factors, but I do still believe that we can mitigate some of that expression of that factor, postpone it perhaps, the, the symptoms might be milder by taking really great care of ourselves and giving ourselves as much nutrition and oxygen and movement, all the, all the good things that we need. Well, I, what I was reading was more like in terms of epigenetics that, which I understand don't affect the actual gene itself, but it affects the expression of the gene. Uh -huh. But there are some studies that seem to indicate that some traumatic events or environmental events can occur in one generation and that expression can oh. still be handed down, which is separate from the genetic structure itself. Yeah. And that I first I remember hearing about that and people saying, yeah, no way. And now I've seen that seen in, in the last couple of weeks, like we were saying, it's just everywhere. Several studies that seem to show that maybe that's true, that in a sense, trauma can be multiple genetic, I mean, multiple generational. Yeah, I'm reading more and more about that and, and believe that that's a possibility, absolutely too. And it can be not necessarily physical trauma, although possible, but mental trauma too. And, um, and I, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to understand how that happens, but I'm not, a, I'm not a genetic scientist, so I'll let them figure that out. But I have been reading that, and I think there's a strong possibility that that's true, that we carry. There's someone who says, um, you're not what you eat, you're what your ancestors ate. Yeah. And I think that's true of food, but I also think um, it could be very much true of trauma. Um, cortisol levels are higher when we have trauma. They affect everything that's happening in our bodies. Um, one of the facts that I learned recently that I found, it was hard for me to swallow, but I do believe it, um, is that when little, when women, when babies are born, female babies are born, they have all the eggs they will have mm -hmm. at birth, at the birth of the baby. So that's a ton of genetics that came really from the mother of that baby, right? And so if she was under a lot of stress during the pregnancy and she had high cortisol levels or poor nutrition or some other problem, it makes sense that that could then affect the, the next child and then the next child, mm -hmm. right? So it's, yeah, I think it's much more complex than we fully understand yet, or at least that I fully understand, but it makes sense. But I like the idea that even if that is so, and that we're carrying some burdens that are generational burdens, that we might be able to affect, sort of lift that that heaviness by being maybe extra careful about what we eat and how we move. Absolutely, I, and I think that that's the that's the key to this whole discussion, is that we do have more agency in our health and our well being and our mental health too. Um, and it, and we just need to be um, more proactive about how we take care of ourselves. And as you say, this was, you mentioned, you know, we're coming into the holiday season when um, the temptations to eat poorly are everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. 
but I love that you said something about greens, greens, greens. And I had this thought, you know, we talk about December greens as thinking in terms of swags and wreaths, but what if we sort of thought, started thinking about December greens and chose the month of December to be the green month. I mean, I personally am growing like 15 kinds of kale. So it's not hard for me to think that way. But it, our local grocery store, if you go to TNC, they have stuff that's grown right here on the island, mm -hmm. at, um, you know, and Middle Farm there, and that we can have locally grown organic stuff. It's a little more expensive, yes. But, you know, it isn't like you're going to sit down and eat a pound of kale, or I'm not. No. Um, but it's if you buy one pound for four bucks and it lasts you five salads, that doesn't seem extreme, right? Mm -hmm. And I love that idea of saying, okay, every salad will have six to, what did you say? Five to seven ingredients. Five to seven, as many as you can manage. Yeah. 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 I think that's a great idea. I love I that. That'd be fun. So like the month of December greenery, right? We mm -hmm. could make our, our December a lot greener. Um, yeah. I'm just laughing because it, it doesn't include Rocky Road. Rocky Road is not a green food. That's right. Sadly. No, it's not, but there are other, if you, if you must have ice cream, there are the green ones. Pistachio is my father's favorite, as I recall. Yeah. So one thing I would like, uh, just fleeted through my brain about the greens and now it's disappearing. Oh, um, yeah. I think the, it, it would take a lot of effort and maybe a couple of generations, but I think including a green salad at Thanksgiving dinner would be a great start towards making the meal more healthful. Um, and the same thing at Christmas time. And maybe exploring, if you're gonna do Christmas cookies, exploring some recipes that don't have cane sugar and, and they don't have white flour. They're really made with, there's so many options now and so many recipes available. And just beginning to kind of shift those traditional kinds of foods to things that still taste good and feel like you're celebrating and loving your family, but you're not poisoning them with sugar. So I have one more statistic I want to just throw out here that I just learned last week and um, about sugar. In 1950, somebody did a study um, and there was in 1950, there were zero cases documented of any child with diabetes type two. It's different than type one, type two. 30 years later in 2010, there were 57,639 cases of diabetes type two in the United States in children. So, I mean, we're not going in the right direction. We really need to make some changes. And those kinds of statistics have been noticed in communities like some of the Native American communities where sugar had not been an important part of the diet at all. Um, it was brought in deliberately almost um, right. as a, you know, but yeah, and I think one of the pieces we might really think about is that I remember reading when I was a child that, you know, in the 50s, the, the average adult might eat 20 pounds of sugar a year, and now they might eat 500 or something ridiculous. I'm making that up, but the numbers are grossly inflated because yes. it's in so many things. Exactly. But I was thinking about my older cookbooks. I have a, a collection of um, some of the quite old cookbooks from the 1800s. And when you look at those recipes, you know, a recipe for that might call for a cup of sugar now might call for two tablespoons then because sugar was rare and expensive and mm -hmm. had to be hauled across the country and, you know, was sort of precious and kept in a special box. And um, it, it wasn't common. And right. people did count more on things like sweet vegetables or sweet fruit. Uh, and so I thinking about going back not to traditional foods, but to way earlier traditional foods and thinking about a, a time when sugar was much less common. Uh, and, and looking at some of those recipes too. It might be fun to explore old traditional family recipes, right? Oh, I think that would be really fun. And I think just shifting a little bit at every holiday and, and kind of changing the mindset for your family in little increments um, would be, you know, uh, every there's a big part of both those holidays that really do center around the food. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting spoiling that for everybody, but what I am suggesting is making some little shifts and changing how you do the yams or the sweet mm -hmm. potatoes. Sweet potatoes are they're another orange food, very healthy. That's a good food to, to really add to your salad, to other things. So, um, but just making these little incremental changes to try to help your whole family have a healthier perspective on food, really. One of our favorite Thanksgiving um, 
side dishes is a roasted combination of quartered Brussels sprouts and cut up yams or sweet potatoes and and at the roast those pretty thoroughly till they're caramelized kind of and then throw in a handful of raw cranberries and let them cook for a few minutes and then the whole thing makes this wonderful balance of sweet tart earthy oh that sounds wonderful it is and it's just a little avocado oil to keep stuff from burning because it's very high temp but you can roast it you know 20 minutes half hour um and that's something everybody actually likes even sometimes to their surprise because a lot of people will say oh i don't eat brussels sprouts but if it's not big soggy steamed funky ones that look like a baby's head right you know, then they're really different. <laughs> I think that's fun to kind of experiment and say, how can I make this delicious? And for me, one way to do that is to look at cookbooks from other countries, like mm -hmm. Oda Lenghi's cookbook called Plenty, that vegetarian cookbook out of oh, yes. um, Israel. Oh my God, it's gorgeous and fabulous. And they're, he's always scattering pomegranate seeds on things and mm -hmm. a little pomegranate vinegar instead of sugar, right? Or um, you're using an unusual flavor principle to make it sort of zing and then you get past the boring vegetable thing into the wow vegetable thing right right i i agree with you completely and that's one thing that's another kind of low cost way to change what you're reading is explore those cookbooks from our library we have such mm -hmm. a great selection of cookbooks at the yeah. at this library and we have access to even more through the extended part of the library but i agree with oh yeah and and Brussels sprouts are delicious if they're cooked properly, if right. they're made interesting. Yeah, exactly. That's another vegetable I would put on the list. <laughs> the crucifers. That's right. Um, well, we're kind of toward, is there anything we haven't hit on that you wish we would have, or you wanted to talk about particularly? No, I, no, I think we covered it all. I just would like to again, challenge everybody who's listening to add some healthy um, addition greens sounds like the perfect one this should be the green month where we're putting up green wreaths and also eating salads and lots of green vegetables um and make little in incremental changes that would be my my last word i think i like that idea and i'm thinking for myself that i might start at different times in my life i've journaled a bit mm -hmm. and i'm thinking you know if you journal about what you eat and how you feel that can be very revealing. And I haven't oh, done that for a long, long time, but I think maybe this green month might be a good time to do that again. Oh, I think that's a great idea. That will give you your the evidence that you're looking for, perhaps. You'll have yeah. it documented. That's a great idea. Right, you can do your emotional thermometer. That's right, that's <laughs> right, absolutely. Um, and, and try to lay off the sugar a little bit. One other thing, coconut sugar is lower on the glycemic index, which oh. means it doesn't raise your blood sugar as quickly as processed white sugar. Um, and so, uh, and it, it can be used as I understand it equally in the same way uh, as you would, the same amount is what I'm trying to say. A quarter a cup of cane sugar, you could use coconut sugar. It's lower on the glycemic index. And the other tip I would give you if you're going to eat sweet things, try to include fiber and fat with whatever the sweet something is. So uh, it, I'm trying to come up with an example. I don't think like a Milky Way or what was it, a Mars bar? Thank that you. fat doesn't count. But, um, but generally speaking, if you include fiber or fat with something that's sweeter, even the apple, you're yeah. lowering the, um, where it, it slows it getting into your bloodstream is what I'm trying to say. The fiber and the fat slow the digestion and that sugar doesn't rush into your bloodstream. So, so if you did a, a fruit cobbler with an oatmeal coconut sugar crust. Yes, you thing. sound like a great cook. I uh, really love to cook. Um, uh -huh, I can tell. Yeah, it's yeah. fun for me. Now I wanna ask all of anyone in the audience, has anybody got a question or a, anything they wanted to ask? I see Rita. What about Demera sugar? That sugar called Demera, is it Demera? It's Demera. Kind of, I, I don't know much about it. I know what it is. I haven't ever seen it listed on the list I have of the good sugars. The things okay. that are, I think it's probably just cane sugar that's been made brown with molasses. It is. That's what it's brown exactly what is. It is. Is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it molasses looks, itself is better than, than sugar. Yes, absolutely. Uh, right. If it's like black strap molasses, it hasn't yeah. been refined, all the good stuff refined out of it. Yeah. My, I have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what bread to buy, to buy, 
that doesn't have sugar in it. I see no reason to have sugar in bread, but I found that Crazy Dave's Power Seed does not have any sugar in it. Mm -hmm. It's made with a fruit. And, but that's the, the only one that I have found. <laughs> Oh, the um, Essential Baking Company has several that don't have any sugar in it. And they're, okay. uh, they're George, big brown loaf is mostly whole yeah. wheat and sea salt and, um, and. Um, well, but I use the, I like the little, the thin bread that's sliced. Oh, right. For, yeah. for, for some things, but thank you. That's harder because you're right that most commercial bread has some form of sugar in it. And even if it's fruit based, it's still sugar. Um, and then no. again, it's partly like, you know, what we've been hearing from Suzanne that we our taste buds are so accustomed to sweetness that we have a hard time. I know in Chinese medicine, I remember being told many times you need to learn to eat bitter. Because, mm -hmm. and, you know, in Italy, when I was a student there, which is where I kind of learned to cook, actually, um, people would drink aperitifs that were called bitters. Right. And that was supposed to stimulate your appetite. And, you know, it's like a tonic sort of. And we don't do that in much anymore. Well, yeah. the bitters are really soothing to the digestive system. And we don't, although there, I've been in the same way that epigenetics has popped up into my um, email feed. I've been seeing more about bitters lately too. I'm going to do some more investigation about that because it's, it's an interesting topic and you can make the bitters yourself. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. Which is always fun. And what a great Christmas present, bitters to go on your greens, right? That's exactly right. Bitter, yeah, bitters to take care of the overeating too, maybe or something. <laughs> right. Well, we are out of time, but thank you, everybody. What a wonderful conversation this has been. And Suzanne, we really appreciate your time and and knowledge. This is great. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for asking me to do well, this.